Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. For those who don't know, I am Greg Poland. I direct the Southeast Asia Program and the Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative here at CSIS. And this is the third of four panels for this year's South China Sea Conference, the 11th annual CSIS South China Sea Conference. Uh, like everything else, because of COVID, we've had to move this thing virtual. Normally, this would be a one-day big shindig here in D.C. Instead, we're doing it over the course of several months. So the last one will be next month. Uh, as a reminder, everything that you hear and see today is going to be on the record. Um, all the speakers are presenting on their personal behalf, not for any organizations. We will have the whole thing up on YouTube and CSIS.org in a day or so after the event. So if you miss any of it, you can check it out there. We'll also be live tweeting it over on the AMPI and, and Southeast Asia program Twitter handles. And the event today is made possible by generous support from the uh, Foundation for EC Studies at the Diplomat Academy of Vietnam, the Embassy of New Zealand, the Embassy of Japan, and the Embassy of Australia here in Washington, D.C., as well as general support to CSIS. I think that's all of my housekeeping for today. And so next, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our excellent panel of speakers. We're gonna hear from three today on the general topic of the military balance at the moment in the South China Sea. So first up, we're gonna hear from Michael Dom. Mike is a uh, senior national security researcher at John Hopkins University's Applied Physics Laboratory. He was previously a career naval intelligence officer and served as assistant naval attache in China and a senior naval intelligence officer for China at the Office of Naval Intelligence. Then we'll turn to Bic Tron. Bic is a PhD scholar at the University of Antwerp, a fellow at Verve Research, and most importantly, a non-resident adjunct fellow here at the Southeast Asia Program at CSIS. And she was previously a visiting research fellow at the Global Affairs Research Center at the East-West Center and at Ritsumeikan Center for Asia Pacific Studies in Japan. And then finally, uh, we will hear from Blake Herzinger, Blake is a Pacific Forum non-resident WSD Honda Fellow uh, at, at Pacific Forum and a U.S. Navy Reserve Officer. Blake spent 13 years uh, in the Navy uh, as an intelligence officer with experience across the Indo-Pacific and, and the Middle East, and his research focuses on Indo-Pacific security broadly. So with that, let me shut up and turn the floor over to our first speaker, Mike Dom. Mike. Okay, thank you very much, Greg. I'm very pleased to be here and thankful to CSIS for providing me with the opportunity to contribute to the discussion today on military power in the South China Sea. I'll go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, if I don't hear otherwise, I, I am going to assume that you can see me or see my slides rather. Yeah, you're all good. Okay, I'm obligated to say at the outset that the analysis and opinions I'm providing today are my own and do not necessarily reflect those of the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory or its sponsors. So if you visit APL's website and click through to the publications, you can find my South China Sea Military Capabilities Studies. It's a series of 10 publications organized into different technology areas. It's largely based on high, resolu high resolution commercial satellite imagery and Chinese language sources. And this series focused on China's bases in the Spratleys, and outlines many of the military capabilities I'll be discussing here today. So I assume this audience is familiar with the geography of the region, but the Spratly Islands are in the southern reaches of the South China Sea, about 1,300 kilometers or 700 nautical miles south of the Chinese mainland. There, in the Spratlys, seven reefs occupied by China are interspersed with dozens of other features that are occupied by Vietnam, the Philippines, Malaysia, and Taiwan. The red dash line you see here is called the nine dash line with, with, within which China has claimed indisputable sovereignty. Um, you know, the problem being that everyone else with claims in the South China Sea disputes China's indisputable sovereignty. So in 2013, the People's Liberation Army or PLA began building artificial islands, which I'm gonna be calling island reefs on top of the features that they occupied. Those island reefs were developed into military bases that were substantially complete in 2018. And these bases provide an interesting and unique case study on the types of military capabilities that the PLA values. On the mainland, Chinese military capabilities that might be associated with PLA base could be scattered across many square miles of Chinese countryside. But in the South China Sea, many of those systems and capabilities are concentrated on these island reefs. So as a researcher on a budget, 
I could purchase just a few high resolution commercial satellite images in order to study how the PLA brings together different military capabilities in the South China Sea. And Greg, I know that you've emphasized this over the years, but you really do have to appreciate just how big China's artificial islands are. If you overlay the island reefs over Washington, D.C., the lagoon of Mischief Reef would encompass Arlington National Cemetery, the Pentagon, downtown D.C., National Stadium. Fiery Cross Reef is about the same size as the Reagan National Airport complex. I recently spoke at the Air University at Maxwell Air Force Base, and I used their base as an example for a size comparison with the Chinese base at Subi Reef. The bottom line is that the major Chinese outposts are large enough to support virtually any weapon system or aircraft in the PLA inventory. But while we often focus on weapon systems and ranges, I think we sometimes lose sight of what is at the center of the PLA's informationized warfare strategy, namely information or battle space information control. The island reefs create a dense network of communication, surveillance, and reconnaissance capabilities. The island reefs have been wired with undersea fiber optic cable, several different types of satellite communications, high frequency broadband, scatter communications, a variety of line of sight communications, the list goes on and on. What this means for PLA ships and military aircraft operating in the South China Sea is that they may be able to operate in relative silence with communications and radars turned off, making them difficult to detect and difficult to target while the island reefs quietly generate and then broadcast battle space awareness. And in a very simple example of how the island reefs provide reconnaissance communications and command and control, we can look at an example from this past spring, the one at Whitson Reef. You may recall the reports of Chinese fishing boats, allegedly part of the PLA Navy's maritime militia, occupying Whitson Reef and forcing out foreign fishing vessels. This satellite image shows the fishing vessels spread out at the Union Banks. Whitson Reef is in the upper right. And uh, in the lower left, you can see Hughes Reef one of China's smaller art artificial island outposts. So Hughes Reef provided the Chinese with significant information overmatch compared to the Philippine vessels that were being harassed and muscled out by the Chinese fishing boats. China's South China Sea bases gave the, uh, gave the Chinese military an outstanding information baseline on foreign activity at Whitson Reef, what you might call pattern of life, so that they could select the time and place where they wanted to intervene in that conflict. As you can see here, Hughes provided the PLA with radar and communications coverage, giving them superior situational awareness and the ability to easily communicate with and control their militia forces at Whitson. But instead of focusing on the essence of, Chinese, of uh, the Chinese military informationized warfare strategy, we instead tend to focus on weapons and hard power, things that go kaboom, and you know who doesn't like things that go boom? For example, we, there have been media reports that China has deployed long-range surface-to-air missiles, or SAMs, on the island reefs. And while no one has seen these missiles in commercial satellite imagery or other open-source images, if they are there, they're most likely housed in these garages that you see in these images. There are eight garages on each major Chinese island reef, which is enough for the eight launchers that would make up a typical Chinese surface-to-air missile battalion. Similarly, similarly, the media has reported that there are surface-to-surface -surface missiles, specifically the very scary YJ-12 anti-ship cruise missile deployed to the island reef. The YJ-12 is a long range supersonic anti-ship cruise missile that's shown there in the upper left-hand photo. So again, no one has spotted these missile launchers in commercial satellite imagery, but if these missile systems are deployed to the island reefs, they're likely housed in garages that look like these on Subi Reef. So while it sounds provocative to say that China is militarizing the island reefs with weapons, I wouldn't oversell the idea that China is going to use those weapons for power projection. In point of fact, as you can see here, the instantaneous striking power of the island reefs does not equal the striking power of just three PLA Navy ships, in this case, a cruiser, a destroyer, and a frigate. But this is just a comparison with three ships. If the PLA Navy were to deploy 10 or 20 ships in the South China Sea, which is not unrealistic, you start to get the idea that the missiles on the island reefs may just be there for defensive purposes. Deployed PLA Navy ships and submarines could bring over 1,000 surface-to-air or surface-to-surface -surface missiles into a conflict in the South China Sea. The real value of the island reefs, both in terms of combat power and battle, and battle space awareness, is both the ISR and the communications that are generated by the island, and as you can see here, air power. What China's South China Sea airfields really provide 
to the PLA is range. That's pretty obvious. They're 700 nautical miles south of the Chinese mainland. But that additional range translates into greater on-station time, greater time in the air for aircraft doing their mission, especially special mission aircraft and UAVs that are providing communications and reconnaissance. Again, information being at the core of China's informationized warfare strategy. So the PLA could certainly fly a Y-9 type aircraft like the KJ-500 Airborne Early Warning and Control Aircraft or the KQ-200 Anti-Submarine Warfare Aircraft all the way down to the Strait of Malacca in the vicinity of Singapore from the Chinese mainland. But at that range, even those long range aircraft would have to turn around for a return flight within about an hour. Basing these command and control and reconnaissance aircraft on the island, on the artificial islands, means that they can operate for an extended period of time all the way out to the Gulf of Thailand or the Celebes Sea. In fact, front, flying from the Spratleys, a Y-9 ISR aircraft could circumnavigate the island of Borneo to surveil activity in the Java Sea. And while we expect that fighter aircraft and possibly even bombers will be deployed to these island reef bases eventually, what we're seeing right now is the deployment of special mission aircraft and helicopters. In June of 2020, we saw KJ-500 radar aircraft and KQ-200 anti-submarine warfare aircraft deployed to Fiery Cross Reef Airfield. Those surveillance uh, and reconnaissance aircrafts are still apparently operating from Fiery Cross, but in June and July of this year, in 2021, uh, this Airbus, uh, <coughs> I apologize, this Airbus uh, commercial satellite imagery spotted special mission aircraft and helicopters also operating from Subi Reef and Mischief Reef, indicating that those airfields are now fully operational. There was an article in Chinese press indicating that a Y-20 large transport aircraft rotated troops off at least one of the island reefs at the end of last week. So I expect we're going to be hearing more about Chinese military aircraft deployments to the South China Sea in the coming year. So this has been a very, very quick introduction to Chinese military power in the South China Sea. We could talk about this for hours, but the bottom line is that whatever military capabilities are deployed to the South China Sea by the Chinese, how far and how accurately Chinese weapons can shoot is going to be determined by how far the PLA can see and hear. The island reefs are key nodes in a South China Sea system of systems that creates networked communications and reconnaissance extending strike and power projection capabilities well beyond the island reefs themselves. And shifting to the, to the north for one final note, while lots of folks, me included, have focused on Chinese activities in the Spratly Islands, we should probably be looking more closely at recent activities and force deployments on Hainan Island. In the past 18 months or so, the PLA rocket force has completed the construction of a missile base on Hainan Island. There is significant construction and ongoing at a small airfield in Sanya that hosts PLA Navy helicopters and unmanned aerial vehicles or UAVs. They're, they've effectively tripled the amount of hangar space just at that one airfield. Construction at Lingshui Airfield appears to be complete. Hangars there have been constructed for what is probably an aircraft carrier fighter squadron and many more special mission aircraft have been deployed to that airfield according to commercial satellite imagery. There was a parking area built at uh, Chonghai Boao Airport on the east side of Hainan Island in 2017. But just looking at Google Earth, you can now see that a large number of KQ-200 anti-submarine warfare aircraft are based there. In the Spratlys, the Paracel Islands, um, in the Spratly Islands, the Paracel Islands, and on Hainan Island, the military infrastructure has been significantly improved to support Chinese military capabilities in the South China Sea. So I think what we're gonna start seeing in the near future is the PLA putting that infrastructure to use and beginning to actively exercise military capabilities in the South China Sea. And those conclude my remarks. So uh, I will turn it back over to Greg. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I think this is the part where I'm contractually obligated to plug the new power projection map that ANTI rolled out last week, which shows how uh, the ISR capabilities on the islands can facilitate Chinese naval and particularly carrier operations far as south in the South China Sea. Reiterating your point that the islands are not the end of the story. And we've, I think, AMTI included, been far too focused on what's been built just on, on the big three in Spratleys. But let me turn the mic over now to Victron. Vic? You're on mute, Vic. Hi. <laughs> thanks, Greg, and thanks CSIS for inviting me to uh, join this conference. Um, so, uh, 
In the late 1980s, Vietnam already felt uh, an urgent need to modernize its militaries after China used force to seize several features from it in the Battle of Spratly Islands in, the 19, uh, in 1988. That led to the death of 64 Vietnamese soldiers. However, not until 2001 that Hanoi decided to invest in equipping the military with modern technologies. Emphasizing on a foreign policy of independence and self-reliance, Vietnam made 17 orders of major conventional weapons between 2001 and 2005. In the next five years, Vietnam doubled its defense spending with 27 arms orders, mostly from Russia. Among those, the most prominent transaction was a $2 billion contract in 2009 to buy six Russian mid class submarines. The first one was delivered in December 2013, and the last one was handed over to Vietnam People's Navy in January 2017. The submarines can conduct anti-submarine, anti-ship, and patrol missions. Vietnam also equipped them with Russian supersonic cruise missiles. With the commission of the last submarines, Vietnam is said to have the most modern submarine fleet in Southeast Asia. Since then, naval power has been Vietnam's priority in its military, military modernization programs. During the 11th National Congress of the Communist Party of Vietnam in 2011, the leaders promised to ensure armed forces are gradually equipped with modern technologies, first of all for the Navy. From 2011 to 2015, Vietnam placed about 19 orders of major weapons. And this period also marked a turbulent time in the South China Sea. And China has conducted large scale reclamation and militarization of contested features since 2014. It's also deployed a wide range of missiles on those artificial structures, which could be used to deny other countries access to maritime and air domains in the South China Sea. Furthermore, in May 2020, uh, 2014, China deployed a state-owned oil rig into Vietnam's exclusive economic zone, sparking anti-China protests across the country. During the 12th National Congress in 2016, Vietnamese leader made it clear that it was necessary to increase resources for defense and security to protect the countries in the new situation. Vietnam's military spending increased almost seven times between 2003 and 2018. However, it has stayed around 2% of the country's GDP. Uh, so, um, you know, despite Vietnam's modernization efforts, its defense budget is only a fraction of China's. For example, Beijing spent uh, $252 billion on military in 2018, which was 45 times higher than of Hanoi at $5.5 billion. So I got this, you know, this uh, data from uh, uh, CIPRI. Um, and, you know, like I wrote an article about a year ago, but back then those data were not, not available. So I used uh, different sources. So the number was slightly high different, but the point is that Beijing is spending a lot more on military than Vietnam. Uh, but after the oil rig incident in 2014, there was a shift in Vietnam's strategy. In addition to self-help efforts, Vietnam has intensified defense cooperation with other countries. With long experience in operating Russian kill class submarines since the mid 1980s, India has helped Vietnam train hundreds of Vietnamese sailors in comprehensive underwater combat operations since 2013. In addition, uh, India has offered Vietnam a total of $600 million for defense purchases. Japan has helped Vietnam improve its maritime law enforcement capabilities with seven used boats in 2014, an official development assistance loan for six brand new vessels in 2017, and a loan from the Japan International Cooperation Agency 
to buy six Coast Guard vessels in 2020. South Korea transferred a Pohang class corvette to Vietnam in 2018. Uh, it is equipped to perform anti-submarine, anti-ship, and anti-aircraft warfare, warfare operations. The United States has provided security assistance to Vietnam through the Maritime Security Initiative, the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, and foreign military financing. The US Coast Guard has transferred two Hamilton class cutters worth $51 million in total to Vietnam Coast Guard in 2017 and 2020. The two vessels were transferred to Vietnam under the US Access Defense Articles Program that offers surplus military equipment to US allies and partners using funds from US foreign military financing. Since 2017, the United States also provided uh, Vietnam with 18 metal shop uh, partial boats for law enforcement missions against uh, smuggling, trafficking, piracy, and illegal fishing. fishing. So uh, security assistance from these countries has improved Vietnam maritime law enforcement capabilities. So uh, I went here and I look forward to the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Vic. All right, uh, let's turn to our uh, cleanup hitter, Blake Kersinger. Blake. All right, thanks very much, Greg. And thank you to CSIS and uh, to your outstanding support staff as well, Danielle and Mary in particular, who helped me square away everything I've done wrong over the last week. Um, thanks, Mike and, uh, and Vic. I've really enjoyed your comments. So I'm going to share my screen here, and I'm going to talk a bit about U.S. capacity building in maritime Southeast Asia. So as Vic mentioned, actually, actually um, Cutter 8020 is one of the cutters that the United States um, has provided to Vietnam through the Excess Defense Articles Program. So if you look at American security cooperation and capacity building in Southeast Asia um, over the past 20 years, it really has roots in transnational terrorism, uh, very much based on this, you know, the traumatic event that we've just uh, passed the anniversary of on September 11th. We're very focused on countering proliferation and impeding non-state actors and terrorists from conducting other attacks. You know, the, the drumbeat was very much uh, avoiding another 9-11 and helping our partners do the same. And so somewhere during the Obama presidency, um, you could see a slow turn towards what we would now call you know, strategic competition or some might call great power competition. Um, I think it's still, to be debated what exactly that, that is and how it, how it really takes shape. Um, but one of the main priorities in the United States right now is increasing uh, reliance on actually a lot of non-military organizations to achieve objectives. Because as I'm gonna talk about here shortly, uh, a number of the issues that our partners and allies face and they need uh, support in are not what the United States traditionally holds as, as defense issues. Um, and and to be honest, the beginning was rough. Uh, it was it was not great. Uh, we led off with something called the Regional Maritime Security Initiative in 2004. Um, that was focused on, on supporting maritime domain awareness in the Malacca and Singapore Straits. It was meant to have a decision-making mechanism uh, as well as like a standing standby maritime force. And uh, as it turns out, Southeast Asia was not in the market for that and no one wanted it. Uh, so our MSI went away. Uh, I actually still have one of the little trifold brochures. Uh, it's hidden away in the desk drawer, just like the RMSI. Um, shortly after that, uh, our Global Train and Equip Program, which was under then Section 1206 uh, in um, fiscal year 2006, uh, we had a lot of projects where we found a lot of money and we put it into security cooperation, capacity building projects that um, subsequent reports have shown to be ineffective. Uh, the planning wasn't good, the strategy was poor, um, and then there was no plan to support them long term. So they sort of rotted on the vine, things rusted, things broke, there weren't spare parts. So our early years of trying to do this were fairly dismal. Um, and then kind of we enter into uh, what I would call our best, our best years really in the region uh, with the Maritime Security Initiative. 
Now, it, it was initially released as a South China Sea Maritime Security Initiative. It was announced here in Singapore at the Shangri-La Dialogue in 2015. Uh, it later became the Southeast Asia Maritime Security Initiative and would now be called the Indo-Pacific Maritime Security Initiative. Now, some of these shifts have been name only and some have actually added countries to the initiative. So it began with five South China Sea countries and now spreads into the Indian Ocean and includes partners like Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, India. And the big pivot that you see here that's been effective is that the United States has moved away from high technology, very complicated, very expensive, very exquisite systems, essentially, that were difficult to maintain and that weren't prepared to be absorbed by, by our partners. So we've emphasized things like training edu and education, information sharing, uh, secure com communications networks, and particularly maritime domain awareness. Um, there have been under MSI and some other initiatives, things like uh, aerial surveillance, maritime patrol aircraft, uh, the uh, the Coast Guard cutters that Vic mentioned, smaller patrol craft. Uh, also, actually, Vic, you gave a lot of my best points. Uh, we should be doing this together. The uh, the metal shark boats. That's been that's been a uh, kind of a common thread throughout the MSI. So that's been great, but um, the future is a bit nebulous on MSI right now. Um, it's a large commitment. The initial five-year commitment was $425 million. When that period ran out in 2020, the program was extended to 2025, but without another authorization for funding. And it has since been subsumed into other funding processes that I'll talk about here in a second. Uh, so a lot of what we do for capacity building has roots and exercises, which also lead us back to that early counterterrorism mindset. So we had the cooperation of float readiness uh, and training exercise and the Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia cooperation and training. The T in those exercises used to be against terrorism. Um, so now we're talking about training. 15 years ago, we were talking about terrorism. And then more recently for observers, you would have seen the ASEAN US maritime exercise that was held in 2019. That was one of the very rare opportunities you know, the United States has to actually uh, interact with all ASEAN partners. Is a bit uh, controversial even then, uh, probably more so now. Um, but you know, the U.S. Navy rarely gets to do an event with Cambodia or Myanmar at this point. Uh, so that was uh, that was something very different. And preceding that was a similar activity that ASEAN and China had conducted. So there's a bit of comparison um, there, and some of kind of tried to make the case that the U.S. was chasing what China was doing. Um, but you can draw your own conclusion there. One of the big capacity building focus uh, areas has been institution building. As I mentioned, a lot of those early projects were very hardware intensive and there just weren't institutions ready to kind of absorb them and integrate them into operations. So the Defense Security Cooperation Agency uh, now has a lot of focus on that. Things like the Defense Institution Reform Initiative, um, the Institute for Security Governance, uh, in Hawaii of the, uh, the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies, and these, these organizations are more on the human side, more focused on human, uh, human capital development, which uh, arguably is a lot more successful than, than high technology capacity building. So there's still a, a big imbalance. You know, uh, there's a lot, of uh, a lot of rhetoric around the United States priority theater being the Indo-Pacific, um, but that's really not borne out in the, the funding allotment for security cooperation, to be honest. Uh, obviously, for years, uh, major wars in the Middle East uh, put CENTCOM well well ahead of all the other geographic combatant commands. Europe had several very large security cooperation capacity building initiatives, uh, the European uh, Deterrence Initiative, uh, which saw you know billions in overseas contingency operations funding being poured into the Middle East and Europe, while Pacific uh, Indo Pacific lagged behind. So it is sort of evening out now, but it's still. Um, if you were looking at the numbers, uh, you would not see a priority theater in the numbers. So what are we gonna see in the future? Um, I, think, I think it's hard to say. Uh, I think that MSI was very, very successful in its, in its uh, first round of five years. And uh, its second round of five years, still similar programs, but I think that the bureaucracy is getting more difficult. Um, capacity building, as I mentioned, doesn't really reflect the priority theater piece yet. I, hopefully with the drawdown 
um, and the, the exit from Afghanistan, we see a change there, but that's yet to be seen. There is a very interesting transparency it, it, uh, issue. If you look into the documentation from the DOD comptroller, you'll see that the Maritime Security Initiative, which used to be a freestanding uh, authorization, is now uh, encapsulated within the International Security Cooperation Programs account. So that makes it very difficult to say how much money MSI is going to get. Um, and it makes it hard for our capacity building professionals to plan ahead. Um, that that was a, a change that happened during the Trump administration, went to the National Defense uh, Strategy Implementation, NDSI account. And now uh, for FY22, it is this uh, ISCP account. Uh, the Pacific Deterrence Initiative, this is actually something that I had the opportunity to ask uh, Admiral Harry Harris about years ago when he was at Indopaycom. And I think his answer then actually, four or five years later is now uh, coming very true. He saw that very much as a US capabilities only. He wanted to buy missiles with it, um, not a partner, you know, building partner capacity type of fund. And I think that's what we've seen come out of Washington this year. Um, it's not tied to meaningful capacity building. It will not have the overseas contingency operating funds, uh, which gave things like the EDI, the, the you know, tens of billions of dollars to put into Europe uh, over the course of uh, a number of years. So it's not going to be the same. Um, so I think it's very much to be decided. Um, we'll see what the Biden administration decides to do. And that's it for me. Thank you all for your patience. Great. Thank you, Blake. Uh, and thank you to all three of the panelists. We'll move into Q&A now. Uh, since we're on Zoom, as always, I'd ask you to use the Q&A function. Go ahead and type your question in. If you could please identify yourself and your institution, that's always helpful. The speakers know who they're uh, responding to or defending themselves against. And uh, I think I'm going to start off with, with a quick question, abusing the prerogative of, of the chair. Blake, just following up on your presentation. So Mike's presentation, I think, pretty clearly showed that China has a uh, pretty solid operating picture uh, over the South China Sea. The explicit goal, as I recall, of the South China Sea Maritime Security Initiative as written was to develop a common operating picture over the South China Sea among all U.S. allies and partners. How do we do? It depends what metric you want to use, Greg. Um, and I know you've written a, a great piece on, on South China Sea uh, MDA uh, for the Navy War College. So I will say at the beginning, there was a big idea that it should be a very high tech, very secure, dedicated COP, a common operating picture, um, similar to something that the US Navy would use, but then we would share that with our partners. Um, and it turns out, you know, with a, as with a lot of uh, projects, the, there was an interest. We didn't have the trust to develop classified networks with partners. The system didn't exist that we were ready to, to field. Um, so we lost some time, to be honest, <laughs> trying to figure that out. Um, Centrix, um, a secure co uh, communications network that's been used in a number of other regions, um, has been introduced in the Indo-Pacific. A number of partners are now using that. Um, uh, and that does have a COP feature. But I would say the greatest success that the U.S. has had is in a, a, a platform called C-Vision, which was developed, as you know, by the Department of Transportation. And it rides on the back of the maritime uh, Maritime Security, Safe and Security Information System, MSSIS. Um, and it's an unclassified MDA platform that our partners can use. Uh, and it's it's been very, very effective, I would say. And, and that team has contributed a lot of time to enriching it. And they're now at the point where they're pulling in a lot of subscription data, which leverages you know that excellent um, public-private partnership that we should be getting into with uh, the low cost of data, uh, like a lot of the stuff that, that Mike used, that stuff is out there for governments to use that don't have their own satellite networks. Um, so I would say now we're in a better place, but it's taken a while to get here. Great, thank you. All right, let's let's turn to the audience. Q starting to fill up. So the first question comes from Andrew K. P. Leon. Uh, I think this one's uh, headed to Mike first. It's uh, Andrew asks, what about China's underwater military assets in the South China Sea? Uh, does China now have a predominant comprehensive denial capability? So I wouldn't describe it as a comprehensive denial capability. Uh, I, I don't think it's a huge secret to say that China is uh, still challenged in the underwater domain. 
the United States and the Soviet Union played cat and mouse for decades during the Cold War, and the United States, you know, still has that uh, kind of undersea dominance uh, in the uh, in the Indo-Pacific region, and China is well aware of that. But for all their shortcomings in the underwater domain, they're starting to do things in the air domain and the surface domain, uh, specifically with things like the KQ-200 anti-submarine warfare, warfare aircraft that I mentioned, the Type 56A uh, light frigate that has an ASW uh, that has an ASW capability and has been produced in large numbers. So you have to imagine again this networked system of systems, where if China starts any conflict, whether it's with the United States, with Vietnam, or with another regional player that has an undersea warfare capability, China starts the conflict with air and surface dominance, which is to say it's going to be hard for anyone to get in there with their, with their aircraft or their surface ships, even if their submarines can. And those anti-submarine warfare aircraft and surface ships are going to be hunting for those for those. Uh, for those foreign submarines in the South China Sea. And, you know, even a stopped clock is right twice a day. So if they can just keep making tracks back and forth, searching for submarines, they're probably going to run across something eventually. And, and again, it's that network system of systems that I keep emphasizing that is going to cause real challenges in the undersea go domain going forward, you know, even, even until China establishes an underwater ASW capability on their own. Thanks, Mike. Uh, it won't surprise anybody that we have a whole bunch of questions about AUKUS, about the Australia, UK, US uh, uh, new security arrangement. And I'm gonna try to bundle these, maybe just go down the line to all three of you. So two of the, the questioners, um, one being Dominic Scriven and the other being anonymous attendee, simply asked, please comment on AUKUS. And the third, uh, our former intern, Karen Lee here at CSIS, specifically asked Vic, we haven't heard any comment yet from Vietnam about AUKUS. Do you have any sense of how Hanoi's responding? So maybe I'll start with Vic and then I'll, I'll ask Blake and Mike for their general thoughts on what role AUKUS plays here. Yeah, thanks. So uh, yeah, you're right that I, ha I haven't heard any official statement from Vietnam either. So it's difficult to guess. But, you know, based on what Han, you know, Hanoi has said about phone ops, then since 2016, Hanoi has issued uh, like multiple statements supporting phone ops. So I'm not sure, you know, where the, you know, this time with, uh, you know, the new uh, pact, you know, people say that it's more serious and maybe Vietnam will be more cautious in this issue than phone ops. So that's what I think. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Blake, thoughts on AUKUS? I think it's great. Um, well, no, I think, I think it's unfortunate that um, there may have been some mismanagement of expectations. Uh, obviously, there are some ruffled feathers in Paris. Um, I think some of that is a bit theatrical, to be honest. I think a bit of it has been overblown, particularly uh, among uh, you know, pundits and people who are, track the issue, particularly Continental Europe, I think, have kind of blown it out of proportion. Um, uh, in terms of the U.S. U.K. Australia relationship, I think it's, I think it makes a lot of sense. You know, the U.K. is very well thought of in terms of uh, what they do in in the region. Uh, I think it gives them, you know, more of an opportunity to continue their tilt towards the Indo-Pacific, uh, to, you know, leverage the uh, the OPVs that they're sending out. And, uh, and I think the submarines themselves that have kind of been at the focus of this, this tripartite arrangement, I think they make a lot of sense. Um, it may be maybe quite expensive for the RAN, the uh, Royal Australian Navy. We'll see how they manage that. You know, it's not an enormous Navy, but it is very capable. Um, you know, they're one of the only uh, operators of a, a major uh, flat top in the region. So I, I think the, the grouping makes sense. I think it's a positive partnership. I think there's a lot of potential there, but um, maybe right now, a lot of people are making more out of it than than we can see. Thanks, Blake. Mike, do you have any thoughts? Um, I just would say, you know, in my opinion, more alliances are better. Uh, the United States has done a good job of managing networks of alliances against different uh, regional threats. 
And I think this is just another example of that, whether it's you know AUKUS or the Quad or the existing alliances that we have with Japan, um, you know, the Philippines partnership relationships with Vietnam. But but again, I come back to uh, something that was talked about in the last in the last question, or I guess it maybe was the first question uh, in this session, which was about that sort of info sharing capability. I think the real strength of something like AUKUS uh, is not just you know providing Aust Australia with technology to build their own nuclear submarines, but it's about creating alliances that that uh, promote interoperability, so you can share information, so that those platforms uh, that are part you know, from those countries that are part of those partnerships and alliances can operate together and interoperate. So, so you can call upon them in a unified collective manner uh, when facing down uh, a conflict against an actor like China. Thanks, Mike. And remember, uh, all of our French viewers can direct all comments and concerns to Blake Kurtzinger, uh, not to not to me, CSIS. <laughs> Uh, Big, let me come back to you. We had a related question from Avinash Kumar um, about AUKUS versus the Quad. He asked which is going to be more effective, and, and I'd be curious how you think Hanoi might be viewing them differently, because Vietnam's been pretty positive on the Quad and pretty quiet about AUKUS. Yeah, so uh, I'm not sure what you mean by effective, but, you know, of course, they, they are different, and uh, with the, you know, with AUKUS, I think it's more formal, a lot more formal and, you know, uh, you know for, and it's also concentrated and emphasized a lot more on, you know, like militaries, the, you know, traditional uh, security issues. Uh, so um, I think it depends on what uh, areas of cooperation that you're talking about, then you can adjust the effectiveness of the, the two organizations, uh, the two groups. Yep. Thanks. So maybe little better, like clearer question. So I just stop. Right, I understand. Uh, Mike, we've got two questions uh, from Stanley Kober and Quinn Marshick, both asking how climate change is going to affect the military utility of, of the islands. And, and you know, there's uh, there's been a lot of talk in Chinese journals that have leaked about uh, seawater inundation and salination and I'm just curious if you have any, have any thoughts here on the long-term viability of, of the outposts. So I have gotten that question before, and the short answer is I'm really not sure. I think the Chinese probably built the artificial islands with sea level rise in mind. Uh, they are very substantial, very robust. They're often described as sand castles or just piles of sand on top of a reef. And they are a lot more than that if you take the time to look at it and some of the research and, and writing that went into uh, uh, the design of, of those islands. It's worth pointing out that China, uh, while they have had missteps in land reclamation, going too fast, uh, buildings kind of leaning over in certain developments on, on the mainland, uh, I don't see any indications that that's the case with the construction that happened uh, in the Spratly Islands. Um, they, they appear to be quite substantial and I think they will, uh, they've been built to withstand typhoons should they come through the area. Uh, and I expect that they will be able to handle, you know, several feet of sea level rise, but I am not a climate change expert. I don't know what the projections are for sea level rise in the South China Sea. Uh, I just don't think the Chinese are, are, I mean, they are very experienced with these types of construction projects uh, in the, in the civil sector. And I expect that that is translated into the, uh, what we've seen in the South China Sea. Thanks Mike. Yeah. I mean, I, I just said ANTI has monitored significant damage from storm surge to both fire cross and mischief reef, as well as up in the paracels in the early stages of construction. But Beijing seems to have been pretty good about preventing that lately. We haven't seen any serious damage over the last four or five years. And while it's true that the underlying reefs are dead now, unlike all the other reefs, so they won't naturally rise the sea level like all the rest of Spratleys, that doesn't mean China can't keep building seawalls higher and higher and higher. And I mean, it's already spent who knows how many tens of billions or hundreds of billions of dollars. I see no evidence that it can't keep up that expensive engineering marvel if it wants to. Let's, um, let's go to a question from Elijah Kilmer. Uh, we've talked a lot about US partnerships in the region, how they're building. What do China's partnerships look like? Who are they pairing up with in the region? How are they operating? Blake, do you want to start us off on this? You bet, Greg. 
Um, so the, the majority of Chinese maritime partnership really comes in the form of, of commercial sales of uh, or grants, partial grants of military equipment. Uh, there are a number of customers, even in Southeast Asia, that are very ready to acquire uh, Chinese ships, Chinese equipment uh, of, of many types. Uh, but but in terms of alliances and partnerships, uh, China famously has, has none, really, save maybe North Korea, if you wanted to count it. Um, the partnership with Pakistan, outside of Southeast Asia, certainly, but still in the Indo-Pacific, um, is maybe somewhere between the two. There is still the military commercial relationship there. But, uh, you know, I wouldn't call that an alliance in the, in the same type of uh, way that the U.S. would use the word alliance. Um, there's a lot of uh, military development. You know, submarines have been a hot topic, uh, selling them wherever they can, uh, a number of frigates, those types of things. But to date, China has not approached partnerships and alliances in the same way that the United States does. Thanks. Uh, Vic, could I also ask for your thoughts on this? I mean, in particular, uh, any uh, path you see to China-Vietnam mill-mill cooperation and, and how that may impact uh, Hanoi's strategy in the South China Sea? Yeah, so I think that um, uh, China-Vietnam defense cooperation mostly focused on high-level contact, you know, exchange talks between leaders, and then also focused on, like, for example, joint patrol on the border areas. So I don't know much about uh, the cooperation in the South China Sea. So if you know anything, please share. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Uh, Greg, if I could, I, I mean, I think we have to mention the China's relationship with Cambodia. I, I recall seeing something recently about you know, China have China, according to the Chinese foreign ministry, a rock solid relationship with Cambodia. And we have heard tell of a Chinese base, uh, either a Navy base or an airfield or both being built in Cambodia. And that really gives China and the Chinese military in particular better access to the Gulf of Thailand to balance out the U.S. relationship with the Thais uh, in that alliance structure. That's a really good point, Mike. And again, contractually obligated to point everybody to AMTI's work on the Rian Naval Base and Darius Core Air Base. Um, but yeah, I think particularly the air assets and the potential for over the horizon sensing capabilities at Rian are pretty significant for the Gulf of Thailand, potentially for the, the Eastern Indian Ocean. Um, let's go to a question from my colleague, Murray Hebert, who's a non-resident senior associate here at CSIS. He asked Mike, uh, China has all this hardware, Intel capability focused on the South China Sea. What do you think its long-term goals are? Is it just to rough up foreign fishers and stop hydrocarbon exploration? I would actually take the position that, you know, hydrocarbon exploration and roughing up fishermen notwithstanding, um, the South China Sea bases are really part of a defense in depth strategy. The, the South China Sea bases really extend China's southern frontier 700 miles south of the Chinese mainland. It, it allows them to operate aircraft carriers farther into the South China Sea and, and then through the Strait of Malacca as a gateway into the Indian Ocean. Um, but, but fundamentally, China is still trying to protect China with the South China Sea outposts. People will talk about how, well, we could you know, hit them with missiles and wipe everything off of the island in a matter of days. But those islands are going to take a lot of missiles to uh, handle the types of capabilities and the types of infrastructure that's already been built there. And that is the thing that you are going to have to get through to get to things like strategic bases on Hainan Island, missile bases, the submarine piers, the submarine ballistic missile pens on Hainan Island. You now have to get through the South China Sea Islands to get to mainland China. Uh, and I think it's part of a defense in depth strategy. Uh, certainly there are issues with uh, China's claims to territory, China's claims of sovereignty over the South China Sea, and they would absolutely have application in seizing or uh, in, in seizing other claimants outposts or, or islands in the South China Sea, um, or to again, lay claim to fishing or hydrocarbon claims in the South China Sea. So we're gonna have to see how that plays out, but. Uh, it, 
you know, the, the South China Sea Islands are not there for one purpose, they're there for many purposes, and we can't lose sight of that. Thanks. I think you also touched on a question we had from Gordon Holden about how vulnerable the, the bases are to attack. Uh, and as you said, they take a lot of missiles. Um, if you have any other thoughts there? Well, and again, it's it's this, you're not just attacking a sprig of sand with a with a missile battery on it. Um, that would be far too simplistic. In, in, and when you look at the concentric rings of reconnaissance and the concentric rings of firepower, and then you combine those with ships and you combine those with aircraft, and you can imagine this, you know, a conflict in the South China Sea really having a layered defense where you don't just get to reach out with a missile and touch the South China Sea outpost. You have to get through layers and layers of defenses to get in a position to conduct your attack. Uh, and even when your missiles get there, in terms of survivability, we have to, again, keep in mind how big these island reefs are, that the uh, there, is lots, there is lots of room to move things around. So once again, we come back to this idea of information control. Do you have enough real-time intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance to see where the missile launchers are moving around the island so that your missile doesn't just fall onto sand, but actually hits what it's aiming at. Thanks, Mike. Uh, next question comes from a friend of the show, Renato DeCastro uh, at De La Salle University. Uh, and I'm gonna ask Blake and Vic to weigh in. Uh, Renato wants to talk about what other al uh, US allies are doing on capacity building in Southeast Asia. He calls out Tokyo, Seoul, and Canberra in particular. Blake, do you wanna start us off? Absolutely. Um, I think this ties in well also with the earlier mention of the quad. Um, this is an area where I, I hope the quad uh, leverages some of this synergy between four partners because they are four major components of capacity building in the region. And, and you're right to include Korea as well uh, to an extent. But uh, of those, um, I think Japan has really been the, the quiet hero of capacity building in Southeast Asia over over decades, really, um, and they've done it very quietly, and they've done it in a way that's politically acceptable, and uh, and partners are, are very eager to work with Japan. Um, and also, a lot of the hiccups that I mentioned with the U.S. not knowing exactly where to plug in and being maybe more defense focused, uh, Japan was very wise in approaching it from a um, you know civilian law enforcement perspective leveraging their coast guard and uh, civilian elements of their government to prop up and to uh and to support partners across the region i think uh, they're very active in that the australians have a very uh, successful patrol boat program it's uh, focused a lot on their periphery pacific offering uh patrol craft to uh to partner nations so they can better enforce their own uh domestic law in their exclusive economic zones uh, or in their territorial seas and patrol their economic zones. Um, so yeah, that's that's an ecosystem that I think all four countries, well, five, if we want to say uh, Korea and include India, need to ensure that they are aligned uh, because it can be very easy to do good, but be at cross purposes or even just out of alignment with a partner. And you're both maybe teaching the same subject, but teaching it two different ways, or you're offering the same capability from two different directions. And that becomes, uh, it quickly kind of uh, overloads a partner who doesn't have the capacity to do three different radar programs, right? Maybe we're installing one set of, of coastal radars and we work together to make sure that our partners are trained and that the radars are maintained. And these are areas where, where all five of those partners can work together to, to achieve a lot more together. Thanks. Vic, do you have any thoughts on, on the role of capacity building from other allies and partners? Yes, so uh, in my presentation, I mentioned that uh, South Korea uh, donated a uh, COVID to Vietnam in 2018. And I know that uh, Korea also gave us uh, a vessel in the same class to the Philippines. And of course, like, uh, uh, you know, Japan has been very active in, uh, you know, supporting Vietnam and the Philippines with, you know, partial boats. And uh, also, like, uh, beside the, the three countries that he mentioned, uh, I see that India also is helping Vietnam. Um, uh, but I'm not, you know, I haven't had a chance to look into detail about how Australia has helped uh, Vietnam and other countries in the region. Thanks, Vic. Uh, 
Blake, let me come back to you with a question from Charlie Brown, who, who uh, I'm sure you know. Uh, Charlie asked what kind of review of security assistance and security cooperation funding levels and processes we can expect from the Congress after the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Will there be an Afghanistan dividend uh, benefiting Indo-Pacific parties? Well, what I can tell you is that Charlie Brown probably knows more about security cooperation in Southeast Asia than, well, he's probably forgotten more about it than I will ever know. Um, but we can all certainly hope that, uh, you know, with the exit from Afghanistan, that we do find a way to reprioritize the funds that we have been spending there and, and put them towards um, these initiatives in our priority theater. Um, because, you know, for two decades, we haven't been able to do that. And we have, um, you know, we've really ran a lot of pots of money dry and and kind of run a force ragged supporting, supporting a war um, that is of course now over um so we can certainly hope so um but i think it remains to be seen i don't think that's clear uh, i don't think that's been clearly communicated from the biden administration that that is their plan uh, to necessarily reprioritize those funds for another defense purpose i think with some of the domestic priorities of the administration we might see them um spent at home so i i guess we'll all find out thanks blake so we've got four minutes we've got 12 questions we're not going to get through them um, I'm not even going to try. Instead, I think I want to give each of you a chance for, for final words and, and maybe something a little forward looking. You know, Mike, what do we do um, about uh, Chinese ISR dominance? Blake, what do we do to get capacity building moving? And Vic, what should Vietnam be doing, given, as you pointed out, the you know huge deficit uh, it has with China in military spending? Mike, why don't I turn to you? Well, I think... Uh... You know, I've been thinking for a while that we tend to fight stuff with stuff instead of fighting strategy with strategy. And um, in this case, I'm talking about sort of operational level strategy where you're taking, you know, tactics and capabilities and 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 uh, linking those to strategic outcomes. Um, so at the operational level, if you're trying to go up against an information centric strategy and China believes that it needs this information superiority, whether it's gonna go after the Philippines, Vietnam, a US intervention or an alliance intervention, you have to take that information away. Um, you have to, to make China doubt whether or not they can achieve that information superiority, either because China's opponent has greater information superiority or China cannot rely on its own ability to generate information superiority. So I think, you know, the types of things that we talked about again at the outset, I mentioned this already once in this Q&A session, but the uh, maritime uh, security initiative efforts to uh, integrate communications, protect networks, and create maritime domain awareness among allies and partners uh, is one of the things that could be done that could have a significant impact uh, on China's um, on China's confidence in its ability to gain and maintain information superiority in the South China Sea. Thanks. Blake? If I could do two things, King for a day, uh, I would fund the Coast Guard to do more capacity building in Southeast Asia. Uh, I think they're a better fit for most partners. I think they do an incredible job on a very tight budget. Um, and I would bring more you know, cutters out as a part of that. Um, and second, I would fundamentally change the Department of Defense to be able to work in the unclassified domain and away from the exquisite network of sensors that we prize for ourselves and think more about subscription-based services, cloud-based services, uh, commercial satellite, and be able to respond quickly to partners who have information needs. Um, because right now, I think we're very uncomfortable working in that domain and we're slow. I think in general, you know, the Twitter MDA community is faster than the U.S. government in terms of sharing information on MDA. Fund the Coasties and uh, make DOD more like AMTI. I like both of them. Uh, Vic? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think Vietnam will never match the level of military spending uh, at China. And, you know, especially with the COVID pandemic's effects on the economy, I think that Vietnam's military defense uh, spending will decrease. Uh, but Vietnam's main uh, you know, objective is to prevent conflict from happening, not to you know, deal with it. Uh, so I think it will 
you know, focus more on, you know, maritime domain awareness and especially in, you know, 2017, United States and Vietnam agreed to, you know, uh, increase, you know, uh, intelligence sharing, but I haven't heard anything from that. So that may be what the two countries can focus on in the future. Thank you, Vic. It's 10 o'clock on the dot. It's time to call it. Uh, thank you all very much, Mike, Vic, Blake, for your time, all of you for tuning in. As a reminder, this is the third of four, so please look to your inboxes and social media for the date uh, and registration link for our fourth and final panel, which will happen sometime in October. And everybody, please have a great day, great evening, stay safe. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Thanks Mike. Thanks, Greg. Have a good night.